beginning of a day, reflections, to bring our attention, to be alert to the way it is. This is a continuous practice. Monastic life itself offers a whole reflection uh, every morning, every evening, kind of ways of constantly bringing into one's attention the way it is. So that the forms we use, the conventions, are helping us. They're not ends in themselves, but merely uh, tools that one can use. Listening to the silence, being attentive to that, not trying to, not sinking into just the mood or the, the feeling, but rising above that, to listen to the silence. You have to pay attention, you have to give up a kind of indulging in, a, in thoughts and moods, feelings of the moment. And in that, there's a transcending of that, you see, with moods and emotions, it's easy to sink into a mood because that's what we're used to doing. When we've not trained ourselves to transcend mood, then we, we sink into it. Either we suppress it, try to get rid of it out of aversion or indulge in it. But transcending it is acknowledging it, but not believing in it anymore, not giving it a second thought or a second glance, but rising above it. So that we use this silence as a way of transcending the worldly conditions. when we use the word transcendence where this is a a word that's increasingly more used now people beginning to awaken to that I think people have forgotten about that religion has been pushed aside for many decades now my generation considered the religion for the uh, archaeological museum. We come to Europe, Americans come to Europe to to look at cathedrals like they were uh, museums. You go and you, I remember visiting Strasbourg one time, going in the cathedral there. And I sat down, started meditating, but I noticed that the place was almost totally empty, and then tours started coming in, tourists with guides, and then they started looking at the cathedral as if it were a kind of museum. Uh, the history, who, who did what, who painted this and sculpted that, and on and on like that. So that it, it a, a cathedral that was uh, designed to remind us of transcendence and become merely another pretty decoration in the history of man's uh, cultural achievements. But now we, we began to say, maybe we can start using these, these old symbols more for reflection and rem- reminding ourselves of the transcendence, of immortality, and that's what they really were meant to be, rather than just as interesting, uh, aesthetically interesting or historically interesting uh, objects of bygone age. Transcending the personality view. This is 
difficult one. We're committed to being a personality oftentimes, the idea of being a, an individual, unique person has been uh, given very much a priority in our lives. So personality view is quite strong. But one can reflect on the personality, the view, the perception of being a person is something one can observe. If one is really a person, then one couldn't observe that. But because personality is a condition, conditioned into the mind, the view of being a person, that perception is something that can be contemplated. So in, in order to do this, sometimes I would bring up into, into consciousness, I deliberately think out my personality, what I wanted to appear like to others. And what, what do you really want to, what is your view of what do you want to express and be in the eyes of others? What do you think, what do you think others think of you? And what do you have to offer others? And what do you want from other people? And what do you expect as a person in a society? What are your expectations and hopes uh, in the country you're living in, the society you're part of? What are your complaints and, and discontentments and so forth as a person, as a man or a woman in the society that you're in? So that you hear, you're listening to this this thing that goes on in the mind of me and mine wanting rights, privileges or complaining about being at disadvantages or being exploited, misunderstood uh, wanting uh, other people's uh, attention or respect or, uh, want, or wanting to arouse envy or uh, in the minds of other people or feeling envious, or feeling anxious, or threatened by the presence of people. All this is, we begin to see as conditions of the mind. But it does take a certain amount of willingness to, to bring up into conscious state things that might be very unpleasant for you, to have to admit. And if it is, if it's really a personal Thing, then of course it is. One is uh, maybe reticent to have to admit a lot of things, but when you see whatever you're bringing up into consciousness is not self, then one feels much more free and willing to bring up even the most kind of frightening personal problems into a full, conscious, full consciousness. So then they c- you can let them go. Remember, only in, when they become conscious can they go away. Oftentimes in, uh, in Britain, people are very much, have repressed uh, anger a lot. They're considered very uh, uh, ugly to, be, to express anger to show anger so that one is, uh, is trying to not do this. And anger <clears throat> becomes something that one is, has suppressed. Hatred and aversion and, and all the kind of negative states because they, they are, they're, because they seem wrong and bad and uh, that we shouldn't have those kind of thoughts. We shouldn't think that way. We shouldn't feel that way. The guilt and remorse, regret, self-hatred, self-disparagement result. Because on that level of ideas, that's true, isn't it? Recognize that on, on one level, that's true, the uh, level of ideas. Ultimately, uh, on the on the ideal level, we shouldn't hate. We shouldn't we shouldn't uh, be jealous of others. We shouldn't uh, be threatened by others. We shouldn't uh, uh, so we shouldn't get angry. And the kind of the ideal 
but then the realities of being a sensitive being, remember, as I said, ideals don't have senses. They can't feel. Ideals are, are kind of static images that, that, uh, that uh, can be very beautiful, but they don't feel anything. Where we're, can, we're very much involved with a world of feeling, emotion, sensitivity, the sensory world. We're feeling it all the time, aren't we? The cold, the, the heat, the, the beauty, the ugliness, the pleasure, the pain of it all. So that when we attach to ideas of how things should be, then our feeling existence, how we feel and, and that sometimes is, is rejected out of consciousness. We by, uh, by uh, fear and anxiety about it. So it, it uh, is never allowed, it's never admitted into consciousness. So it never really is let go of. It's never really allowed to cease. You develop a habit of repression. And repression, it means that your repression conditions uh, it's opposite of having to, it will arise again. This is the interesting thing, as long as you're alive and you're, and you're not letting things go, then, then things that you're trying to get rid of will always come back on you. Annihilation uh, brings back birth. Like, so whatever you're trying to kill off will come back. That's why suicide is a total waste of effort because you have to come back again. <laughs> have to go through it all again. <laughs> That's why, why in wisdom we, we bear with this mortal coil till it dies naturally. Allowing it to die in its natural death, whatever way it, it goes, it, this is as long as we aren't uh, out of aversion and hatred of it, making it, uh, annihilating it. Or well, apply that mentally, to mental conditions. <clears throat> as long as you're uh, busy annihilating things, it's suicide, isn't it? You're actually killing things. But they keep coming back. They'll keep bothering you. They'll keep pestering you. Keep torturing you. Whatever you suppress out of ignorance, aversion, they'll keep torturing you till you allow it into consciousness. Which means you're 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 letting it be as it is, bearing with it, and allowing it to go away. So then it then it reaches its Cessation, its karmic force is expended. It ceases. What arises, conditions arise out of the unconditioned and cease in the unconditioned. And the karma, karmic force has, has ended because you've not uh, acted out of greed or aversion to it. So it's when we, when we live more in this consciousness, when we use consciousness for allowing things to cease, that we, 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 our karmic uh, problems start fading away. We begin to experience cessation, and in cessation there's peacefulness. When you keep practicing like this, you begin to really have a very peaceful mind. The mind naturally is peaceful. It's in its natural state. Unconditions, as an uncondition, it is truly peaceful. Still, that's where intelligence is. Where, where things manifest in in uh, in a human being, when when there's no self, when there's no uh, ignorance, then what manifests through these human bodies is metta, kindness, karuna, compassion, 
mudita, joyousness, and upeka, serenity. Now these aren't personal anymore, are they? These qualities are what we call the divine qualities. Now the, the earth qualities are the body, isn't it? The earth, the earth condition is the body. So that has its karmic force and, will, and when it's time for this body to die, it dies. And while this body exists, when there's no self, when there's no ignorance, no attachment, then the divine manifests through these earth conditions, the bodies of human beings. So we say divinity or that which is divine or celestial, which is truly beautiful, can manifest through the human form. And of course, there are human beings who, who, who do this, the selfless human beings, the enlightened beings, then are that, that very kind of condition which manifests the divine onto, the, onto this planet. And that's why it's a blessing. Human beings can be great blessings to, the, to this planet, to all sentient beings. Or we can be nuisances, I think we tend to be more like that these days, causing endless problems. <laughs> curses, some of us. Absolute curses. But, but this is not the way it has to be. As, as humanity awakens and fulfills itself, then humanity will be a great blessing. Because it's through this, these kind of earthbound, limited bodies and minds that divine divinity can manifest, can appear onto the, onto this earth, and bless all beings. Now, really contemplate this in when you when there is no self, when there is just clarity and purity, brightness. There is also that there's one realizes what real intelligence is, and in, and in that and wisdom, and then the what is natural to that state is 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 uh, these divine abodes, the Brahma Viharas. <coughs> so the so the heavens and the earth, and say it's the marriage of heaven and earth, poetically speaking. Where the human being is the kind of the the uh, that which brings the heavens and the earth together, or the child, say that which is born with the marriage of the heavenly father and the earth mother. If you want to use those symbols, mm. these are religious symbols, aren't they? Dating way back, who knows when, because. These symbols are the, the are tools that we can use to remind ourselves. Symbols are they're, they're, that's what they're for. They're to be contemplated, not to be grasped. Like this Buddha image, it's to be contemplated. It's not if you uh, superstition. You think it, it has magical powers, maybe. If you're prone to superstition, you think that Buddha Rupa has, has magical powers. Or you're the kind that says, I don't think, I think all those images are just terrible. Worshipping idols, bowing down to idols. We should just throw them all away. Or, what is that, what is that really, what is it? You know, contemplate it. What is a, why, why do they have such a form as a Buddha image? When we go into, uh, like, cathedrals or churches, uh, rather than, than going in with a bias now, and saying, I'm not a Christian and I don't like... 
or trying to uh, look at it, uh, trying to get too analytical or intellectual about it, just observe it. How to use a, a Christian church to remind yourself. Uh, in the Europe there is a Christian background, and Christianity has existed for so long here, that there's all these Christian symbols around. So we can just think, won't pay any attention to Christian symbols, don't believe in Christianity, and just reject it. Or to think that if we start contemplating Christian symbols, that we'll become Christians and have to give up Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> or to contemplate, what are, these, what are these really, how can we use these churches and symbols for reminding ourselves to be awake? to be unselfish, to, to be alert to the way things are. And this is a way to skillfully use the existing uh, conditions that we do have in the cities and towns and villages that we live in. My reflection, for example, on, uh, on churches in England. And there's something very satisfying, very pleasing when you're driving along in the English countryside and you see a church. Where somehow the old churches sit in the villages, uh, their presence there is something that I find very pleasing, something very kind of reassuring. It's a beautiful form, isn't it? it? It's the church, the old European church, is a form that kind of fits into nature. It's one of the, the more beautiful kind of uh, creations of, of human beings. Because most of the churches, they were built for, out of that sense of devotion. They weren't just kind of egotistical creations. <coughs> Also their form, the, the sense of a steeple in that, something that's pointing upward. Where you notice so much of modern architecture is very squared off, kind of big blocks, blocks on top of blocks. And in, uh, in London, where you see so much, um, the modern buildings are merely kind of building blocks blocks on top of blocks, squares on square. Everything's kind of squared off, earthbound. So they don't inspire the, the mind. When you see uh, the modern buildings, banks and insurance buildings and so forth, they don't, they might be very <coughs> impressive in their kind of uh, solidity in there. And that, they give that feeling of being very solid But they don't inspire the mind. There's nothing in them, usually, that, for the most part, to me anyway, that, that brings any kind of inspiration in the sense of looking upward. When we lived in Oxford, we used to go on alms round in the colleges. Sometimes we'd walk down to Christchurch College, down by the river, and we'd look up at the skyline of Oxford. Uh, in that old part of Oxford, it doesn't have any high-rise buildings in it. So all you see is a skyline from the river of church steeples. And it actually, it looked, looks like a celestial city. You can see the kind of vision that probably created such a place of building a celestial city. It has that kind of feeling about it. They have those, those, all the kind of church steeples on the horizon. The same in Thailand, when you, if you've ever been to Thailand or lived in Thailand, the, the Buddhist temple, the Wat and all that, there's something when you're going, traveling in Thailand to see the, the, the Wat, the monastery, the temple, is something reassuring. Something that is a, a beautiful thing that that humans have created, rather than a an ugly thing. 
because this is what people's aspiration goes, their religious energy. One time I, I was invited to a place called Dartington Hall in Devon, a famous kind of New Age school, uh, quite famous in Britain. And while I was there, they had an American architect who had created out of his mind the kind of futuristic city where, uh, and he had a model of it, quite a well, very nicely made model of this idyllic city where, for the future. Very, uh, with great kind of aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic values were, were very important. So everything was done to a very high standard of beauty, refinement in form. But I looked over this model and uh, it's quite lovely, yes. But I said, uh, I said, what is, what is at the center of this city? And he said, the coffee shop. <laughs> and I asked, where is the church? And he said, oh, well, then he pointed off beyond the model. It's somewhere over there. So that the temple of the church was was not the center, but is some something that you didn't even bother with. It was out, outside the model. And all around the coffee shop were the the other businesses and. I thought that's significant, isn't it? That, that uh, to people like like on on that level creating the perfect city. It's an ideal, isn't it? This kind of idea for an architect, maybe, creating this perfect image of a city where you can actually build a model and try and get it to the kind of proportions where everything is, is just, as, uh, you know, according to your aesthetic taste, uh, everything is right. But yet, say, in, in, in Europe, you know, it's the really beautiful towns and cities, they're all, the, the centers are the churches, aren't they? In the old, uh, old cities anyway, old towns. So that the center of, the place that is the center, the, the center symbol, central symbol, is something that's pointing upward to the heavens from the earth. It's solidly like placed onto the earth, its foundation is on the earth, but then it, it points up towards the heavens. It doesn't just bind us to the earth. Religion is, is not, is, isn't that which holds us down onto the earth and rubs our noses into the mud. But it's what is inspiring us to aspire, to, to move upward, to rise upward rather than just sink down into, into the muck. And this is uh, this we need to really contemplate in our own life. That our life needs this this inspiration, this this movement upwards to rise up in life, to hold ourselves up, to move upward rather than to just sink downward. The body eventually will sink downward. As you know, as you get older, your body tends to sink downward. <laughs> because the bodies, when they get old, they're, they're moving back into the planet again. They're, they're, that's their karmic, that's their karma, to be born out, kind of independent for a while. And we, we, the bodies, these these uh, earthbound bodies, they have a sense of rising above the planet a bit. I mean, you can actually walk, you can move, not stuck into the ground like a tree. So this human form has this sense of having, 
having freed itself from just being stuck in one place on the planet. But eventually it will be taken back to the planet again, absorbed back into, into the earth. But during this transition that we're involved in of this human lifespan, we, because of the pressure of the body and the tendency to uh, the, the force of gravity on the planet, uh, this we have to put more effort to rise up to. Why, how did humans evolve anyway? How did we get to kind of walking on two legs and and why are our aspirations always towards getting outside, getting beyond the planet itself? Is this kind of madness that you know trying to send rocket ships into outer space? <laughs> There's another one, isn't it? Trying to get the body even farther away from the planet. But in reflection, we see that the body actually it doesn't need to. We don't need to to make the body uh, move off into outer space because mentally we can do that. Mentally we can aspire. But we need to have the balance between the heavens and the earth, not prefer one over the other or grasp one and reject the other. So that in mindfulness, wisdom, we find the harmony, the, the harmony, the peace of mind, the true peace and stillness comes from the proper relationship between these two, the heavens and the earth. So in this way we contemplate the, the body, the instinctual nature, the planetary uh, experience that we're involved in, the emotions, which if when they're undeveloped, when they're caught up in selfish selfishness, then they become just uh, things that carry us all over the place. But when matured, when the emotional nature is balanced and mature, then it's then it then it expresses itself always as compassion and love, joy, serenity. And then that supreme intelligence of knowing, wisdom, so that this, the heavens and the earth are no longer at war with each other. In the human mind, we can be at war, can't we, all the time, between these two. Constant struggle and resistance, either falling down to the earth and groveling in it, or trying to get away from it and resisting it, trying to get up to the heavens. Uh, these two kind of extremes of the, uh, the, what kind of emotional imbalance is about, isn't it? Either you're sinking down, groveling, wallowing in the mire, or you're, or you're desperately trying to get out of it and trying to get away from it, rising up to something out of aversion to the other. But note, in, in meditation... It's all taken into account. We're not taking sides. We're not just condemning the earth, We're trying to get away from it by by living in a, in a, in the heavenly realms. But learning to uh, find the perfect harmony between these two: this body and its earthbound condition, and the emotions and the intellect. So the things that we experience on the visual plane, say, here, and all sensory experience, then we start contemplating in this way. We begin to see it as Dhamma, as truth, rather than, than as uh, seeing it as personal, seeing it as uh, making out something out of it, may ex exaggerating it, or just refusing to accept it. In, in Pali they have a word 
a very significant word called papancha. Now papancha means conceptual proliferation. In English we say conceptual, this proliferating tendency of the mind. For example, when we contemplate, this is the way it is. Say this, say, for example, just say this clock. Let's say in its suchness, as it is, it's just this way. You don't even have to think of it as a clock, do we? You don't have to even think clock. It's just this way right now, when you're just mindful of it. But then the papancha starts, and this is my clock, and and I, I like this clock, and I don't want anyone. To <laughs> or I start being critical of it. I don't like this clock. It's not the kind of clock I want. I want another kind of clock. That's conceptual proliferation. So that the the reaction, isn't it? The the habitual reaction of attraction or aversion, and just the the spewing forth as proliferating tendency to see this and. And, and then to proliferate on it. And you can see it with pushing people's buttons, they call it these days. You should push a button and they, and they go off. You say, uh, nuclear bomb, and then they go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you say, Mrs. Thatcher, and then, blah, 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 blah. Proliferation, it's almost like conditioned response. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> That's conceptual proliferation. You, you can, some people, you can just, you can push a button and you, one moment, and they'll, they'll go blah, 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 and then you go on to something else, then you push the same button and they'll say, and the response will be the same. And this condition, isn't it? He can be just that kind of, kind of just programmed to when when this particular thing is is pushed in us, then this response is given out. Remember one the, the musing. When I when I was uh, had a few only a few years among them, somebody came. This was during the Watergate scandals in America. American came and and I said and whenever I said the word Nixon, he would give this incredible tirade. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, first I said Nixon, then the conceptual proliferation went on for a while and went on to something else and then I thought, well, see what happens. I said, Nixon again. <laughs> and the same tirade. Tried it a little later, Nixon. And Contemplate yourself, like 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 when you're when you're really empty. You, there's just this way. It's just this way. There's there's no sumato bhikkhu or or anything. It's just this way. Contemplate like this. Right now, this this being here is this way. Now in this statement, it's just this way. There's no. It's merely a a reflecting ability to reflect. There's not a, it's not papancha, it's merely a skillful means to, to be alert. The, the name Sumato, Ajahn Sumato or something, comes up only when, when something uh, stimulates that, that, uh, that kind of thought, isn't it? I don't sit here thinking Ajahn Sumato, Ajahn Sumato. <laughs> Or a Buddhist monk, or things like I'm a man, or an American, or whatever. These things 
these things don't, they come according to, to, to other conditions. But right now, they, if the, in the mind's empty, it's just this way. There's no person, personality, there's no man, there's no monk. In, in a sense of, in the mind, it's just emptiness. It, things are just as they are. It doesn't mean that, that one isn't seen or one is not aware. It means that one isn't creating anything onto this moment as it is. It's just this way. So you, in contemplating like this, you began to feel this sense of emptiness with the moment as it is. And you don't feel that you have to make anything out of it. You're not, you don't have to create anything onto the moment. It's, it's complete in itself. But before one ever realized this, one was always creating things, like you'd be thinking about yourself or wondering about someone else, or fiddling with something, or there's always this Thing, a kind of papancha, this proliferating tendency to be doing things or thinking about or worrying about or, or creating some kind of complexity onto the present moment. Believing in yourself all the time as being a kind of permanent personality, a permanent man or a permanent woman or a permanent monk. Like if, if you're attached to being a monk, then you're kind of permanently a monk, so that you, you feel you attach to that perception uh, that you're permanently a monk. But you're never permanently anything. Being a monk is a relative thing. The idea of being a monk is something that comes up according to conditions. It's not a kind. Of, it's not the natural state of affairs. It's not the way it is. But it, it's the way it is only when the conditions for it are there. So even though the body is in a, in a monastic-looking uh, uh, appear, uh, apparel, what I'm pointing to is the mind. Even the mind is, is empty. And so even the, the monastic robes are just this way. They're just this way. And it, no, that th this way, just this way, is is merely a recognition, but not a not a, a statement of quality or a personal attachment. Now, in reflecting like this, you you know we perceive we say say a clock. We perceive this. We all know perceive this as a clock. I hope. I think we do. <laughs> so we all agree to call this a clock okay? but actually it's just this way <laughs> in suchness it's, it's, it hasn't, it, it, we give it a name we call it something and it, and it, and it was made uh, to be to have a function but in in its suchness, as it is, it's just it's just this way. And so, in the empty mind, things are just what they are. They're just the way they are. They have no name. They have no. They're, they're, there's we we needn't give them any quality. Or create anything about them, so that there's this this peacefulness in the sense that one is accepting things as they are, without feeling compelled to to accept or reject or name, give it a name or, or anything else. It's just this way. Now that's a peaceful state to be in. But then we get attached to, to the ideas that we place on them so that the mind, we see a clock and it stimulates, this is my clock. This is a quartz uh, clock. It doesn't tick. It's silent. It keeps good time. It has a tiny little battery. It's very light. You can put it in your bag and it's not very heavy and uh, convenient. It's cheap, though. It's a throwaway clock. 
<laughs> not worth if it breaks down. You might as well just throw it away because not like a Swiss clock. <laughs> Handmade in Switzerland by Swiss clockmakers that are great value, treasures of the world. This is a cheap plastic clock made in probably Japan. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see. <laughs> uh, throw away. That's a, that's a proliferation, isn't it? Plastic. They, plastic is another button in people's mind. Plastic, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> the New Age mind uh, think, considers plastic terrible. Uh, those plastic clocks. <laughs> or if your maybe plastic is something you really like, you say, this is really like plastic. <laughs> but actually, this is just what it is. And we needn't give it, we needn't call it plastic or think anything about it. It's just this way. And in that, and in that, in, in its suchness, it's, it's as it is. It's, uh, you know, then we say it's plastic. It's a clock. We go. It's a cheap clock, or it's a, it's a very. Or we might look at it in a positive way. If we're looking at it critically, it's a cheap clock. But if we look at it in a positive way, it's a very light clock, and it keeps good time. And it's not expensive, so you don't worry about it. if somebody takes it or it breaks down. You don't, you don't feel tremendous sorrow. Or if it were a really valuable clock. If it had, was something with jewels in it and all that, then you'd have to really be careful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because the expensive buttons have been pressed in your mind. <laughs> this, this is something really worth something. Uh, there's an amusing story about the Sangharaja of Thailand. And he, he likes to tell his story about himself. The Supreme Patriarch of Thailand, and he he was invited to China several years ago, and so a kind of an official visit to China to Peking, and he uh, of course they gave him nice presents and whatnot. So they gave him a beautiful teacup, uh, a Ming, uh, very valuable, very beautiful old kind of porcelain teacup. And uh, so the Sangharaja said, when they gave that to him, then he became very concerned about this teacup. And all the way back to Thailand, he says, now, when, they, uh, when they boarded the airplane, he says, now be careful, put the teacup in a safe place. <laughs> Did you put it, you're sure it's not going to break? And all the way back to Thailand, he was, he said, when he re went back to his monastery, he said, now, now, where's that teacup? Did you put it in the in the in a safe place? And so it became a burden for him. This this beautiful teacup, because whenever the thought, the perception of that teacup came, he said, "It's very valuable. It's very beautiful. I've got to protect it. I've got to see that it doesn't break." And then one day, a samanera novice, young novice, clumsy oaf, broke it. <laughs> <laughs> So he, the novice was frightened. He thought, oh, the Sangharaj is going to really, really be upset. So he went and he said, uh, he said, sir, he said, the, the teacup is broken. And the Sangharaj said, oh, thank goodness. Don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> That's proliferation, isn't it? This, the values we place on things. And now, conceptual proliferation isn't bad. I'm not condemning that, but to know it, because, uh, it so to give qualities and names can be a very skillful thing to do, and to take care of things is. Make, uh, be mindful. This can be a skillful, uh, mindful experience or a mere obsession. Kind of blind obsession, uh, grasping at this and fearing and, and possessing. 
But in, in our contemplation now of Dhamma, we're, we're, uh, we're looking at, at the mind, the, 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 the kind of conditions and the predicament that we have as uh, being a human being. They're not, not condemning anything or saying that we shouldn't proliferate or shouldn't uh, have any, couldn't, should, we shouldn't care about an ex, uh, a beautiful old porcelain tiki cup. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, it shouldn't make any difference. I'm not saying that. But we can use this human, can, this human situation and its absurdities for reflection. We learn from it. And pointing out in this way, this is, say, this is the way it is. This is just what it is. It's just this way. And then, say, as we abide in that state of emptiness, we're still looking. We can still see it. We, 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 we have a name for it if we need one. But it's, it's beginning to see it without this need to make anything of it, to compulsively go on about it. So when we do that, even with, with our thoughts and names and loved ones and all that, we begin to have space around the things that we love and like too. We, they don't, they're no longer uh, going to harm us or be great burdens to us. If we can see them in, the, in, this, in, in their suchness, then the beautiful things and the, the love we have for others, and all that is is in is in a perspective. It's not an end in itself. It's not something that that we proliferate endlessly about and worry about and create a problem about. So you're freeing yourself from suffering by seeing things as they really are, which means that you're you're still with them, but you're not suffering from them. You know, it's like in, a, say, when you when you're young and you fall in love for the first time. You fall in love with somebody else, and you don't. You're you're naive, and you're you don't you 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 don't know what to do, so you do it all wrong. You have this feeling, say, for the first time, that you want to give yourself to somebody else. A kind of pure feeling of total unselfishness at first, say that that really wonderful thing we call love is experienced in a moment maybe of wanting to become one, totally give ourselves to someone else unselfishly. But then because of lack of wisdom and all that, we tend to start, because we like that, that's such a beautiful feeling, a beautiful experience, then we start grasping at it. We think, now, if I own that person, <laughs> if, if, I, if I can own that person, then I can feel that way all the time. So then we become possessive and jealous and we create and we mess it all up, don't we? What was once, a, what was at one moment a very pure, uh, unselfish experience becomes a very selfish, demanding, grasping, horrible disappointment. So in that, one reason why uh, love is rated so high is because it actually, in one does say for a moment, actually have, feel totally unselfish and giving. And that's a, that's a very beautiful, blissful state to be in. But out of ignorance, because we're not wise, then we, we remember that we think by owning the other person, we all kinds of controls <laughs> that we're going to be able to have that all the time, isn't it? It's a, out of ignorance, out of not understanding things as we are, <laughs> as they are, we create a, a problem about it. And so that problem makes it into a burdensome thing, into a horrible, disappointing, heartbreaking experience. But that's how we have to learn. We, we, we always seem to, to, I mean, when I hear the pop songs, they're all about broken hearts and 
lost uh, lovers and and great anguish and sorrow at disappointment at, and the, in the in, at having lost or been separated from the loved one because this this love what is it, is a unitive experience isn't it there's, there's no self in it but then without wisdom it becomes possessiveness It's like when we see something, some beautiful uh, object, say just a material object. We, that sense of, of the true kind of experience of enjoying its beauty is from a pure place. Suddenly something in us is fully with that beauty. But then the, out of ignorance, we want to possess it. I want it, so then it's covetousness. We create a proliferation, a conceptual proliferation. So then we, we start trying to, we are steal it or try to get it in some way, thinking that by owning it, by actually holding on to it, that we're going to enjoy its beauty. But if you've noticed, when you own things, when that sense of ownership comes into something, one doesn't, doesn't tend to enjoy it anymore. It becomes a burden. Because that true enjoyment can only come from an empty mind, when there's no demand, when there's, when there's, when things are as they are, and the the sense of me and mine is is not has not arisen yet in regard to it. The conceptual proliferation. So note this in in, in your own experience, uh, because you can be aware of this. This is bringing into your consciousness now the way things are and then you can be aware. You have something to work from. You begin to know the habit tendencies that you create onto anything, onto yourself, onto someone else, onto the world. That you have a clear understanding of this is the way it is and then the papancha, that which we create that which we're out of ignorance. Papancha is the, is the stuff we create out of ignorance.